student in the Public Policy and Global Affairs program here at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Uh, we're pleased to respect the traditions of the Coast Salish people and in particular I wish to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional, ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam peoples who have called this area home for many years and continue to do so today. <coughs> So just a brief introduction of our panelists. Um, first here we have Dominic Hogg, who has 25 years of experience in the environmental field as an academic campaigner and consultant. And his work ranges from policy and strategic studies through to due, due, due diligence for funding organizations. Uh, we also then have Usman Valiente, who is a senior policy analyst and commercial strategist with 27 years of experience in environmental science and economics, corporate and commercial strategy, as well as public policy development. Then we have uh, Stephanie Burrell, who is a David H. Smith postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Toronto, and her current research applies ecological population modeling techniques to evaluate how different mitigation strategies can reduce plastic from entering the oceans. And finally, here we have Lucas Hicks, who is the BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Um, but he just wanted me to know that he is on education leave right now. And he is currently doing his Master of Arts in Geography at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And our panel today will be moderated by David Boyd, who is an Associate Professor of Law, Policy and Sustainability at the Institute for Resources, Environment and Sustainability, as well as the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. He is currently also serving as the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights and the Environment. So I'll pass it off now to David to begin. Yeah, I'm actually, um, as moderator, I'm going to take up as little of your time as possible today. So we're actually going to just get started. Each panelist is going to give us a 15-minute talk, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. So, uh, so we'll start with Dominic. Let's give Dominic a nice round of applause. We're clapping for the end. Um, so I uh, am so pleased to be here. This is my first time ever in Vancouver. It's a city I've always wanted to visit, and I am really, really pleased to be here. And um, I'm just going to get the glasses so I can hit the right button on the presentation. And um, my uh, background is sort of slightly weird. I have a, um, a degree in uh, bachelor's degree in physics and a PhD in economics, and um, I get involved in a lot of sort of multidisciplinary policy studies. And uh, uh, what I wanted to do today, I was man asked me to uh, talk about some of the things that are happening in Europe where we're trying to get to grip with this uh, huge global problem of um, plastic pollution. And um, perhaps put that into a bit of perspective, but also into how perhaps uh, he might get one better. Uh, I have a few slides of introduction about who we are. Um, some of the things we're doing might be quite interesting. We're doing some uh, work in uh, Indonesia, Greece, and UK about um, policy-oriented models to show impacts on uh, plastic gains and seas of different policies. Policy to clean up the rivers in Indonesia, the Brantas, is um, not quite as well known as the Citarum, which is one that's attracted a lot of attention. Uh, lots of things going on. I don't know if I'm too much on that. I want to show you, um, first of all, um, what a uh, bit of background to what the EU has been doing over time. It's important to notice that uh, the European Union has really taken to heart the, um, the desirability of pursuing a circular economy for materials and, and waste, and, uh, and to try and stop waste becoming waste in the first place. And that's to some extent been at the heart of a lot of what's been happening over the recent years. And um, we've been involved in the review of the key directives on, on uh, behalf of the European Commission 
one on waste, one on packaging, one on landfill. Uh, those have really shaped how uh, those materials are managed um, in the European Union. And some of those measures are just about to be causing massive change throughout the European Union, recognizing that in the past we've had measures like extended producer responsibility in place, but there's been this big gap between uh, what was intended and what's actually happened on the ground, this big implementation gap. I was saying to David, sometimes you get the feeling with member state governments that they transpose the European measure into law and they think just by writing it down somehow it's going to happen. And so you get this big gap between um, people writing something into a law and actually making it happen. And I think that's a common theme that we see globally is that sometimes people are genuinely stumped as to what they should do. And so in a sense we see it as our task to sort of create the, the policies and measures and, uh, and so forth to, to help change. So as part of the circular economy strategy, the, the European Union said they wanted to focus on a number of materials, and one of them was plastics. This was all about making plastics flow in a more circular way, keep them in useful uh, applications in the economy. And, and we developed a strategy for the European Union looking both at macroplastics, the big stuff that you see, and the microplastics, both the intentionally added ones in the wash-off products and things, and also the ones that um, we see in uh, being, being caused by things like abrasion of tires uh, and the washing of clothing, the microfibers from those. Um, but the, uh, as part of that, they decided, right, we're going to take some action on single-use plastics and fishing gear. This is the legislative measure that's been going through the European Union right now, and uh, it's been had a, an amazing level of unanimity uh, around the issue between what's called the European Parliament and what's called the European Council, which are uh, environmental ministry representatives from the 28 countries constituting the European Union. It's gone through remarkably quickly, and the final vote is due on, in March, and it's likely to get signed in law then. Um, it was voted through in the Parliament recently, the Environment Committee there, 44 votes to one. And everybody was asking, who did it? <laughs> so what we did, it was quite a pragmatic approach, really. We looked at the, the 10 most often littered single-use plastic items on beaches in the European Union. So first of all, here's the split between plastic and non-plastic items on beaches in the European Union, insofar as we can uh, discern. If you split that 82% down into, should we say, general-use plastic items, and those arising from fishing and aquaculture, it's about 55% of the all items are those general plastic items. And if we then look at how much is the single-use items, of the total number of items is 49%. So our 10 items were tackling some 49, a, a substantial swathe of the 49%. And if we look at those items, <laughs> we see that we've got, um, by count, insofar as we can tell, we, we focused on the 10 leftmost items. And some of those are stuff that are sort of generally arises as waste type items. Others of them we've identified as flushable items because they're the ones that are often causing problems in, in sewers because people are sending them down in sewers. So we also looked in the plastic strategies worth saying this at the microplastics and um, looked at the intentionally added and the non-intentionally added. And it's interesting to, to see, you know, I've just been in California where they were one of the first jurisdictions to introduce the ban on microbeads in cosmetic products. Um, we've now done that in the UK, copied that, but you can see um, the, uh, the, the, the blue, blue, the blue, the blue sort of stuff, the intentionally added microplastics in those, single, uh, in those um, personal hygiene products are not a major contributor, as far as we can see, to the problem. It's great that we've done it because it felt like a bit of a no-brainer, although some of them are saying what's going to be in its place. Uh, so, you know, we've got, um, we, we, we've got some things going on there. But look at the other microplastics. We've got things like tire dust. Tire dust is a real problem. Why? Uh, certainly in Europe, we're finding that uh, tire dust is now a bigger contributor to uh, air quality problems from particulate matter from vehicles than the vehicle emissions themselves. 
as the vehicle emissions are reducing, <coughs> but the tyres aren't going away, we're going to switch to electric vehicles, they're going to be heavier, and we're going to start to see even more tyre abrasion potentially, unless we start to understand formulations and so forth of those materials. So, um, what's the use of the ease? We're doing loads of things. Um, new waste legislation, waste packaging, plastic strategy, covering everything. Final stages we're in now on this single use plastics directive. We're also looking at proposals on port reception facilities because we know people are dumping stuff at sea. One of the problems is that people charge people to dispose of stuff when they get back into a port and they're thinking, well, how can I put the disposal charge? Oh, just dump it in the sea. So, you know, we're looking at how we can regulate that better. Um, uh, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, member states are going to take action already. They don't, they don't do much of, of meaning. They did with the meaning the state we're in. Uh, and we're also looking at wastewater treatment directive. I'm going to focus now just very quickly then on these, uh, what's going on in the single use plastics directive. It's okay if I jump away from the mic, but <laughs> we, we looked at these things in terms of what, if you look at the top categories, uh, you know, what, what can we meaningfully do with some of these items that we're looking at? Are there ready substitutes available? Can we just ban them? Are they just wasteful products? So we sort of set them up into four categories of the European Union. Uh, category one, we've got waste management options in place, plastic bottles. Should we ban them? Probably not. They're not the worst way of delivering bottled beverages if you're going to have them. But what we want to do is make sure we get them in closed loops and, and keep them in the cycle. So we're saying, right, we want the collection rate for recycling to be at least 90% for all of those. People alluding to the fact that we can probably get them with a deposit refund system. Um, we know we can. We've got led to several um, instances of that happening already in Europe. We're going to tether the caps to the lids. So we, you know, some deposit schemes, you see a reduction in the littering of the bottles, but not so much of a reduction on the caps. So we push for the caps to be tethered to the bottles. Industry doesn't like that. It's a big, big pushback. So we've allowed a bit more time, five years, for the adaptation to take place. And then we're, this, this, you'll see extension of EPR across the piece here. What does that mean? We've already got extended producer responsibility legislation. That's going to require now full cost coverage of collection and recycling of plastic packaging. It's also going to require that the fees that the producers pay are going to be modulated according to one or more of recyclability, reusability, durability, presence of hazardous substances, so that the fees that people are going to pay are going to shift them and give them an incentive to do more by way of eco-design. And that's, but what we're going to do here is we're going to say, we also want you to pay for the cleanup. If we find this stuff being littered, you're going to pay to clean it up. So that's part of your extended producer responsibility, part of the costs that we're going to internalize to you. Go on to the second category, cotton birds, stores, stores, cutlery, plates, sticks for balloons, EPS cups, and takeaway, uh, for takeaway food packaging. Um, these are going to be banned in two years' time. The oxygenable products are also going to be banned at the same time, by the way, as Saudi Arabia is saying, you know you put plastic products on the market, they're oxygenable, which is slightly strange. Um, and we're going to see these banned in uh, two years' time. The EPS food packaging wasn't in the initial proposal, and really unusually, because these directives often get watered down as they go through the political process, that was added in. So extended polystyrene cups and food packaging came in during the negotiation of the measure. Category three, we've got alternatives under development. I think we have gone further here. So basically we're saying we want significant reductions. Well, what does that mean? You want to see, so it ended up with a requirement that the member states should have measures in place to achieve those significant productions, as well as the EPR. And the last one, um, where we, you know, the argument was there weren't sufficient alternatives, lots of the NGOs say, yes, there are. And I have a lot of sympathy with, with them, with some of these. We're looking for better marketing of products and how they can be better managed and, uh, uh, and, the awareness of the possible damages that can be <clears throat> happening as consequence. So last slide, going one better. Come on, you can do better than this. This is, you know, this is a start. Why can you go one better? Okay, there's a few things you can do. You can lengthen the list. We've gone for the top ten. We've put them into a law. 
So guess what? People are arguing, we should be number 11. We should be number 12. We shouldn't be number 10. And so I think you've either got to lengthen that list or you've got to revisit the analysis and say, right, if you're in the top 10 in four years' time, you get hit by this one of these forms of measure. So if you do that, then of course people start acting now to make sure they're not in the top 10. So you get a sort of dynamic announcement effect from the measure. So um, periodic update. Second, not just plastics. You know, if I'm going to ban plastic disposable cutlery, do I really just want to switch into wooden stuff? You <coughs> see that later as well. Because by our analysis, littering has an economic consequence, almost irrespective of whether it's plastic or not, prior to it going to the sea. People don't like the look of it. People are prepared to pay for a litter-free environment. So why don't you ban the plastic, put a fee on the non-plastic disposables, and make sure people are really shifting into the reusables? And that's, that's a problem when you're focusing only on plastic. Um, and here, by the way, you can determine the measures. So we've got, uh, in Europe, the, the, way, the reason why it says you want you to do significant reduction of these measures um, is because we allow the member states to specify the measures themselves. You, as the state government here, you can specify the measure. So put in place a levy on all single-use cups. Do it tomorrow. Do it at sort of 40 Canadian cents or something like that. And see what happens in terms of the number of single-use cups that people use, and see, you know, just, just do those things. And then there's that last category, be bolder on some of these other items. One of my colleagues, a lady called Kiarina, whilst, whilst we were doing this study, gave a sort of impassioned plea to all these men around the table as to what they should be doing for tampons. He said, look, what about toxic shock and all this? They don't seem to realise that girls are being hooked on this at the age of 14 by companies going into the schools and basically flogging their products, giving them out free. There's alternatives. Okay, don't necessarily ban them, but let's, why not have a fee on them? Why don't we start to look at getting people to look at the alternatives that are there? And I think some of the NGOs, they've really got those sort of, sort of things in their sights. And I think that's a, a really interesting to look at. <coughs> um, and finally, time for phase out. Time is a really interesting dimension. That points about tethering. You know, if you're not sure whether industry can really do things or not, tell them that they're going to happen, but give them a bit more time. So if you don't think that we've got enough alternatives to plastic crisp wrappers or plastic sweet wrappers today, say we're going to ban them in seven years. Maybe put a fee in, in the meantime. And just start to give people the, the clarity of thought that Actually, that's where we want some innovation now. We want it to happen. We want to see what, what goes on. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dominic. And what we'll do is we'll go through all four panelists, and then we'll have the question and answers afterwards. So next up is Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
I was Tiparel uh, Tokonoa. Um, my name is Tiparel from New Zealand. Um, thank you for coming off. I'm a David H. Smith uh, postdoctoral research fellow, and I'm <coughs> spending two years working on evaluating the impact of mitigation strategies. So, taking a bit of a step back from Dominic and what he was talking about, um, and asking the question about how much impact do these um, interventions or these mitigation strategies actually have on reducing plastic pollution in the ocean. I was trained as a conservation ecologist, so my um, background is really about the impacts of plastic on the environment. And we've been very good at putting plastic into the environment over the last sort of 70 years or so since we've been producing it commercially, and it's having um, a devastating impact on many ecosystems and many species. And initially we started thinking about things like, oh, well, let's ban plastic bags because they're not very good for turtles. So um, we have these sort of piecemeal approaches to uh, addressing the issue. More recently, the global community has started talking about <coughs> plastic pollution um, as, as a, a globally significant issue and sometimes compared to as, um, as, as bad a problem as climate change for our oceans. And so there's been a lot of action happening at the international level, particularly in the last two years. Um, and actually at the moment with the United Nations Environment Assembly are convening to talk about the potential for a globally coordinated um, uh, strategy or agreement on reducing plastic pollution in the world's ocean. What does that mean and um, what does it look like? To be able to answer those questions, if they're going to put a target on reducing plastic pollution, um, either be having countries implement different strategies to achieve a certain target, or, um, or uh, and do that in a globally coordinated <coughs> way, or allow countries just to choose on their own. Um, we still need to answer a few questions, and what we need to know is what are the current levels of plastic emissions that are entering the environment? Um, what are the effectiveness of the strategies that we've just been talking about at Dominic's Commission and actually reducing the amount of plastic entering the environment? So if I don't love for EPR um, or a mitigation strategy or ban plastic bags, if there's the volume of plastic that we're using and we're consuming is continuing to increase and not actually offsetting those reductions. Um, and then also what reductions are feasible given a, a time scale? We have to think about um, a, an end point. What are we aiming for? And these are really important questions that we need to answer um, in terms of being able to figure out the, the pathway that we're going to take. So I said I'm a um, conservation ecologist. I'm not um, a, a statistical modeler or an economist. Um, and so we, I've been working from an ecological perspective, thinking about plastic as though it were a population. Um, and so we're taking stage-based modeling techniques from ecology and um, applying them to, to plastics. So you might remember them from your um, early education as a um, something, something like the monarch butterfly life cycle. Discrete stages that move through and transition and you can describe them based on those distinguishing characteristics. So we're looking at plastic in the same way. We produce red, um, plastic resin, it gets turned into a product, then turns into waste. It either enters the environment because it's littered or it escapes um, through various pathways, goes into the waste management stream, or it gets um, put back into resin. So there's a bit more of a circularity or potential circularity, which I'm sure we'll talk more about <coughs> soon. The plastic pollution pathway is a little bit more complicated, as you can imagine, than a one up butterfly, butterfly life cycle. Um, I'm not going to go through every single part of this model because it's, it is very complex and this is an overly simplified model of the plastics um, uh, value chain. But what I want to point out to you is there's, some, there's three main um, groups or uh, stages within the model and that's production. So each of those boxes you can consider a stage and we've categorised the plastics being made into different products and that determines the way that it moves through the waste management um, system or and how it might escape into the environment. <clears throat> the links or the lines between those stages are transition, so how it flows, and we've got rates of how um, different products might move through um, <clears throat> through the cycle. Then we've got our waste bin. Once it goes into the waste bin, um, you'll see on, on the uh, left-hand side there, there's, there's a double box, um, it's kind of hard to read, but one of them says mismanaged and one of them says managed. And then we've also got two sides of the model which include microplastics and macroplastics. So microplastics take a very different pathway 
um, to entering the environment than macroplastics do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So once it's gone into the waste stream, it can either be managed and put into landfill where it's kind of contained for a certain amount of time, or it's mismanaged and it has the potential to escape and leak into the environment. <clears throat> And then it leaks into the environment, and within the environment, it actually moves around. So how do how do plastics move from a river to the beach to the near shore to back to the beach and then back out into the um, middle of the ocean? It takes quite a long time for plastics to make their way from land to the middle of the ocean. And so we're trying to figure out all of these things because we need to know um, <clears throat> we need to know the dynamics of how it moves in the environment so that we can actually figure out how to clean it up if that's the strategy that we need to take. So adding on top of that, we can turn on these levers, which are our mitigation strategies. So you can, <clears throat> and they are either in between the transition zones or in the stages themselves. And that can change the volume of plastic as it moves from one stage to the next, or it can change the rate of the transition from one stage to the next. So in our um, <clears throat> production, we can um, look at things like reduction of um, products or material switches, bans or levies, so reducing the actual use of itself. And then in the waste management or the waste bin, we can um, look at extended producer responsibility, increasing recovery rates, container deposit schemes, um, waste capture and things like that. And then the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff is the clean up. How do we get rid of the, the plastic that's already in the environment? That's the, sort of the last place you really want to be focusing a lot of your efforts. But it, unfortunately, we're going to have to start um, spending a bit of time doing that. <clears throat> This is a really complex model, as I said before, and um, we've been working on this for about um, maybe a year, maybe a little bit less. So we've been able to um, code in and produce a functioning model for this particular portion of the, the, um, the model. So from like mismanaged waste or waste that enters the waste stream and then how it enters the environment. We're still collecting data on um, categorizing those products into, into, different, into the different stages at the top there. And as you can um, uh, appreciate, there is a lot of data, but it's all over the place, and it's very, it takes very time consuming trying to get that plastic, uh, trying to get those categories. So <clears throat> there's already been some research done, and you might recognize this, this article about plastic waste from land into the ocean, and this was done by one of our members of our working group, Jenna Jambeck, and she calculated, and her and her colleagues calculated, that it was about 8 million tonnes in 2010 that was entering the environment. Um, and one thing I want to point out there is a caveat that that model was done with um, within 50 kilometres of the coastline. So you're talking about large urban areas that are within 50 kilometres of the coastline um, releasing or emitting 8 million, um, million tonnes of um, plastic into the environment. <clears throat> what we've done with our model is actually extend that. We've now done a, a spatial model which includes inland areas and it's based on waste per capita, so waste generation per capita and then a degradation rate from inland um, sources of plastic as it moves towards the coastline at, or into the environment at a lower rate. And um, as you get closer to, the, closer to the, the coastline, you have a higher rate of plastic entering the environment. So it includes a little bit more spatial complexity. Um, it, makes the model incredibly complex and it takes two days to run just that spatial component of the model at the moment. Um, so it's very data intensive, um, very power intensive. But I wanted to just give you a model demo because this is really exciting for me. We've um, just come up with these initial results in the last couple of days <clears throat> and they're not 100% correct. We've still got to do a few things with them but it's pretty exciting to see how, um, how the utility of the model and how we can use it to, to evaluate different scenarios. We've done it in a global scale scenario, so looking at, <clears throat> again, that 8 million metric tonnes of how has that changed since, since 2010. And what we did is we have about 190 countries and we categorise them by their income status because that actually tells us a lot about how much plastic they use, what kind of waste management infrastructure they have, and what kind of leakage rates they have. <clears throat> so high income, upper middle income, lower middle income and low income. And you can see the differences there in, in per, per capita consumption of plastic um, and also their waste management infrastructure. And we've done this scenario to 2030, and bear in mind this is only 11 years in the future. So these are, um, <clears throat> this is quite a short turnaround in terms of actually reducing um, or evaluating um, how much plastic is, is entering the environment. We've got a few assumptions, of course, built into this model. 
Um, we assume that population growth follows a projected increase in population or slight decrease in population depending on the country um, from the World Bank. So Japan, for instance, has a slight reduction in population over the next um, 11 years. Plastic consumption, again, is based on World Bank projections, which uh, uh, decreases slightly in high-income countries and um, upper-middle-income countries, but, reduce, uh, but increases quite significantly in lower and middle-income and low-income countries. <laughs> Mitigation, um, and both of those, sorry, I just wanted to mention as well, those are exponential growth um, factors that we've uh, that we calculate the model, and then our mitigation strategies that we've, we've looked at um, are implemented in a linear scale, so they're implemented over time, they're not just turned on and then that's it for the, for the 11 years. And then also the waste generated in a country stays there. So we've done a waste generation per person um, and then have, have locked it into that country, so we're not including waste trade in the current um, model as it stands. So we've done um, our baseline, a counterfactual, which we compare on our other, other scenarios. We've got a business as usual, so high income countries, uh, use is going to decrease slightly over the next few years, it's going to increase quite a lot. In our low effort scenario, we decrease those um, that use of plastic, single use plastic predominantly, um, <clears throat> by about 3% increase in, um, uh, at a lower rate for lower middle income and low income. Again, median effort, you decrease that slightly more and level it out to current levels for low income and then high effort is quite big reductions in terms of reducing per person consumption of plastic. So if you think about using 20% less plastic that you might consume on a daily basis or annual basis. <coughs> Excuse me. And then for our waste management, we have again the same kind of things at the moment. High income countries have a really high waste level of waste management. So up to 97% in most countries. Um, there's a lot of variance in this, and we've built that uncertainty into, into our projections. But um, one thing I really want to point out now is the low income. We're assuming, and this is why it's incredibly ambitious, is to think that we're going to increase waste management in low income countries from a current value of 37% to 75% in 11 years. That's an incredibly ambitious thing to try and do. How do you, how do you achieve that? What are the same factors that you need to um, think about the infrastructure that you'll need to put into a country to achieve that kind of level of waste management. And that includes um, collection, recycling, um, engineered landfill, <coughs> and that sort of thing to reduce the leakage amounts. And then because we're talking about a global ocean, we're talking about all the pollution that ends up in one particular space, we looked at reducing or taking um, a percentage out of the accumulated value over the next 11 years, <coughs> and 10%. Um, Maybe we can do more, maybe not, but based on our expert uh, knowledge, we thought that 10% was about the right amount. So, <clears throat> what does all that look like? It looks like a lot of plastic, like an awful lot of plastic. We're talking about from, I'm just going to go over here, so this is 51, business as usual, it's 51 million tonnes, metric tonnes of plastic. By 2030, in a business as usual scenario, we're talking about 75 million tons of plastic entering the environment. And then with our low, um, high impact or high effort scenario, it drops down a little bit, and that's again because of the exponential growth. But then once population and um, the per capita use of plastic starts to um, increase again as as population increases on that exponential curve, whatever mitigation strategies we're doing here is actually pulling it down there, but it's going to start increasing again. Um, it's kind of a sobering outcome, I thought, when I first saw that. Is it realistic? We use an awful lot of plastic, so I think so. Um, we're producing upwards of nearly 400 million tonnes of plastic every year, and this is only a small fraction of what might actually leak into the environment. So, um, and then the accumulated values are up there around a billion tonnes that might end up in the ocean, accumulated in the in the global ocean by 2030, under a business as usual scenario. <clears throat> then we can look at different income stratus and look at how um, the different relative contributions. High income countries have a lot of work to do. We are contributing the most amount, 35, um, 34 uh, million 
uh, tons of plastic by 2030, upwards from 23, uh, 21 or 22 years. I mean, <clears throat> the same thing for upper middle income, a little bit less, but uh, <coughs> and lower and middle, uh, low income are, are contributing very low amounts, and that's because their per capita use is so much lower than what ours is um, in high income countries. A couple of caveats that I want to point out there is that weight does not equal impact when we think about these things. I think about it from an ecologist perspective. So if we ban plastic bags, it doesn't mean that that's not going to happen. It won't, it won't reflect in our model, but it does reflect in the environment. So we're thinking about how we code that kind of um, ecological impact into the outputs of our model. Um, and again, it doesn't also include um, the inequity that goes with the trade of waste. Um, we talk about sanitary products or um, types of plastic and things like that, and, and that leads to a lot of inequality um, amongst um, people around the world, particularly in low-income countries as well, but also in high-income countries um, when women don't have access to alternatives for sanitary products or things like that. Um, those are things that we need to start thinking about. So now the question is, what are the best tools to um, reduce plastic emissions? How do we pay for it? Um, we could think about something like the United Nations Fund for Climate Change, um, which helps, looks at um, wealthier countries helping poor countries, or low-income countries, to um, build that infrastructure. Um, global plastic tax, I don't know what that looks like. This is why I'm here and working with Usman and, and other economists to try and answer these questions about what are, the, what are the strategies that are actually going to have a meaningful impact on um, reducing plastic emissions and how do we pay for them, how do we implement them, and how do we do it quickly? And I'll finish it there and leave it up to everybody else. But thank you to my partners and all of them. Thank you very much, Steph. And now over to Lucas from the BC Ministry of Environment, but not speaking for the BC Ministry of Environment. Okay, great. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Lucas. Um, happy to be here today. I am um, a graduate student at Memorial in St. John's, Newfoundland, but I'm also a senior policy analyst with the BC Ministry of Environment. I'm ed on pardon me, an educational leave right now doing my master's, and I plan to return to work in September. Um, I've also done a lot of work with the Surfrider Foundation here in British Columbia, doing beach cleanups and organizing other types of class inclusion advocacy. Um, and that's kind of what's found me on this particular topic. So being in the seat as a regulator, working on EPR policy packaging, um, and seeing uh, the sort of flows of materials, how they change with that type of regulatory program, and then also being on the beaches and cleaning up waste, cleaning up packaging. And so being able to see uh, the issue from both perspectives has been really eye-opening and has sort of led me to this research project. So um, really in a nutshell, what it is is I'm looking at citizen science, so beach cleanup programs um, that collect data. Um, I'm looking at the metrics and categories they use to track packaging pollution and how those relate to the metrics and categories used by government to monitor and evaluate the performance of EPR policy. So, um, so a lot of slides in here. I'm going to actually just burn through a bunch of them just in the interest of time. And I think from um, the other speakers I get a handle that you guys know quite a bit about um, policy. So I'm just going to flip forward to this slide here. So this is a slide from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, on the global flows of plastic packaging materials. Uh, as you can see, the, the flow is really is largely linear. And so when we think about EPR as a particular policy, um, the intention is to make producers more responsible for the materials they produce, the packaging they use, um, 
And that responsibility is stretched to uh, the end of life phase. So they really have to collect that material, process it. Um, and when governments regulate uh, EPR, they do so by setting targets in many cases for these producers to adhere to, to achieve. And so the idea with EPR, when you layer it onto this flowchart, is by setting higher performance targets in terms of recycling and landfilling, et cetera, you, you reduce the leakage of material into the natural environment. That's the, that's the assumption. Um, but I think what's really important to note in regards to EPR is that conventional EPR programs don't monitor leakage on beaches. They don't monitor leakage in the ocean. That's not a component of their regulatory reporting obligation. And so um, that's what kind of inspired me is like to really look into um, that relationship between what is on the beaches in terms of um, in, when thinking about a jurisdiction that has an EPR program. So citizen science, I'm just going to burn through this uh, in a nutshell. Uh, groups doing cleanups, collecting data, um, and generating, generating ideas on sort of what type of trends are on shorelines. Um, it's really critical, I think, in many jurisdictions because it can be sometimes the only uh, type of data on shoreline pollution levels. And so it really plays an important role in illustrating what, um, what the pollution levels are. Um, yeah, and I think the timeliness for this type of research, uh, what I'm seeing is there's an increase in uh, the use of citizen science data to be used as a metric for evaluation of certain policies. So these headlines here are from uh, the state of California, where they recently introduced a bag ban um, on single use uh, plastic bags in 2014. And using data collected by citizen science through the International Coastal Cleanup, these articles state that there's been a 72% reduction in plastic bag widths uh, when compared to 2010. So because of that, um, typically the only information available on, uh, on plastic packaging and other types of pollution, it's become um, a lot of organizations that, in this case, uh, journalists have relied on it as the sort of metric for evaluation. On the policy side of things, uh, we're, as Dominic, Dominic alluded to, we're seeing an increase in um, agencies and government bodies looking at EPR as a solution to plastic uh, pollution. Um, so both uh, the directive that Dominic referred to in the EU and here in Canada, uh, just recently the strategy on zero plastic waste uh, makes uh, uh, statements towards uh, continuing the development and implementation of EPR. Um, and, that, and that strategy is largely focused on uh, marine plastics as well. And so my, my research, uh, like I mentioned, is really focused in on those on that relationship between the categories used by both entities, citizen science and EPR. Um, and so kind of looking at that from a qualitative angle and then um, digging into uh, some of the trends that are found in um, citizen science data. And so the case study I used um, is British Columbia, partially because that's where I'm from and I work uh, as a regulator for the Ministry of Environment. I'm so very familiar with the, uh, the legislation um, but I think more importantly, it's the only jurisdiction in North America to have introduced 100% industry-funded EPR for packaging back in 2014. So um, it's got a massive amount of coastline over 28,000 kilometers, so it's a really great uh, case. Um, also, packaging materials are one of the most common types of debris found at uh, cleanups. So uh, every year, the Great State Insurance Cleanup publishes the dirty dozen. And we see time and time again that packaging items are uh, very common. <laughs> and there's lots of citizen science groups doing uh, cleanup work here in the province as well. This is the list of the groups that have been involved in my uh, research project. And some of them have been doing lots of data collection before the introduction of EPR, and um, some have been doing it after, but there's a great mix of information that's available. So I've taken a mixed methods approach to my research. I've done um, a lot of sort of data um, work with the, the information I've gathered from uh, citizen science groups. And I've also done a lot of qualitative work doing interviews and document analysis with uh, different um, organizations. So looking both at citizen science, with government, and with industry. So the industry group in BC that's responsible for operating the packaging program is called Recycle BC. So looking at a lot of their literature as well. And so um, I'm going to share with you some outcomes, super preliminary. I just started gathering this stuff in the last few weeks to month or two as I've been 
wrapping up the anal uh, analysis portion with my advisors. So I'm sure that this will get more refined uh, as I approach the end of my project, but uh, some exciting stuff that I'd like to share with you anyways. <clears throat> so when I did the qualitative research, I um, looked at uh, text from field notes, transcripts, document text, and I broke down all the different things into a several categories. So I looked at uh, packaging waste and debris measurements, so looking at the metrics and the different uh, measurement approaches that groups use, uh, both on the citizen science side and the regulatory side, um, looking at debris categorization, what, what the origin of the categories are and how they've changed over time, how things are defined, that, that sort of thing. And then the purpose of the data. In the case of citizen science, like why do they collect the data? What is the intention of it? And I think that's really key. I'll touch on that briefly. Um, and so these are a couple of observations that are really um, important for the findings that have that I've been able to identify. So uh, I want to point out that in BC, the Recycle BC program, um, up to I guess the current plan that's in operation right now, they're obligated to report on a recovery rate, so the amount of product collected versus the amount of product sold in, in province. And they do that for all packaging, so plastic, glass, metal. It's all one single basket of goods, if you will. Um, and, and that's what um, they're reporting on an annual basis. Uh, the plan that's being proposed is in front of government, so their, their new plan, they, they will continue to do um, a program level recovery rate. They've also proposed to do material level recovery rate, so breaking down um, different types, in the case of plastics, looking at rigid and flexible uh, packaging and like, articulating certain polymer types. So getting more granular in terms of the data that they're um, that reporting. Another key thing to think about too, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the Recycle BC program is focused on the residential waste stream, so it does not include the commercial segment of the market. It's just focused on uh, residential lots. So that's also important. Uh, I'll touch on it in a moment. And then this table on the right, in terms of the citizen science groups, um, some really interesting findings have been popping out about the data that I've been looking at there. So this is sort of a, a matrix that breaks down all the different groups you know, <coughs> that are doing cleanups in the roads and then the different methods they're using um, as the columns. And as you can sort of see when you take a step back, it's a bit of a patchwork. There's no real one clear defined method that they're using. Um, I think the most common one would be total weight. Um, the green squares represent the current method, the yellow ones, ones that they've previously used. And what's really interesting is that a lot of groups have migrated away from using larger standard uh, methods, so things that the Great Canadian Shoreline Data Board, the NOAA's uh, Shoreline Survey Field Guide. Um, and so definitely a bit of a, um, a transition occurring at the moment. So I'll just talk about that here next. So these are the key things that jumped out at me from the qualitative research. Um, the pollution profile between remote and urban beaches is very different, and that's really influenced people to move away from standardized um, classification systems. Uh, because they were just weren't meeting their needs. And with that migration, they've lost a lot of details I've observed. Like they don't focus on a lot of categories in terms of specific packaging items. So they're 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 kind of leaving that behind. Um, and building on that, what we're actually seeing is uh, citizen science data collection practices are becoming more aligned with end-of-life management options. So what's really fascinating about citizen science is that these people are they're beholden to what they're gathering and observing. They want to they want to remove it and they need to manage it. And so um, when you think about the options available in your community, there's certain ways that waste managers will take materials, and that is influencing how they're going to categorize what they're, what they're gathering to make it more efficient for them. So we're seeing the end market really influencing um, the categorization um, upstream, if you will. Uh, and that kind of building on that, both Recycle BC and many of the groups that are doing cleanups, they're adapting their categorization to focus on polymer type. Again, because the end markets are really uh, specific in what they will accept and how they'll accept it, polymer type is an effective way of facilitating recycling or end of life management. So that is becoming a dominant type of categorization. Um, there is a little bit of uh, overlap when you look at Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup and uh, NOAA, for instance, in, in terms of what they actually ask volunteers to track, food wrappers, six-pack rings, those type of things. But it's complicated um, to really align that with, uh, sorry, I think it's kind of limited to use that in terms of looking at EPR because 
the way the legislation is structured, as I mentioned, it focuses only on residential. So sometimes it's difficult to determine exactly uh, where a piece of debris came from, whether it leaked from the residential waste stream or the commercial. And so um, while there is some overlap, uh, it becomes complicated when you start digging into the real legislative structure. Uh, I won't go too deep in that, but just something I want to highlight. Yeah, in terms of the quantitative research, um, as that table previously showed, there's a lot of different types of data sets, and that's really made it quite um, a diverse opportunity for doing analysis. And um, the way I approached looking at the data was really generating examples of the different type of trends that you could uh, create when you're dealing with this information. And so, um, just to burn through them really quickly, um, there is some long-term longitudinal data present through the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. So this is just a small subset, but there is uh, lots, like thousands of records. So there is the possibility of doing long-term analysis. There is um, uh, a couple opportunities to do short-term analysis. So Surf Rider Foundation, they have a couple chapters. They've been using NOAA in the past, and so they have some data that you can do. Um, uh, they have less records, but still opportunities to do analysis. Uh, one chapter, Surf Rider Vancouver Ground in particular, they do both um, cleanups in urban and remote uh, locations. And what's been really fascinating is to sort of see how packaging deposition patterns change across different geographies. And so, of course, we see a lot more packaging pollution in urban locations versus remote locations. Um, and this is a bit chunky, but oops, as a lot of the groups are moving away from individual categories of packaging and looking at weight, uh, or polymers and that type of thing, they're losing uh, the ability to use that data to look at specific packaging materials. So trying to look at Great Canadian Shore like they have draw out estimates that could be used to pull out uh, packaging particular levels from um, data sets that are becoming primarily weight-based. So there's a lot of work to do here, but it's just something that I've been exploring. But sort of the main uh, takeaways that um, <laughs> A sort of arise. But I think what's really important to remember is that uh, you know citizen science appears to be a really attractive option because there's lots of data out there. No one else is doing it in many jurisdictions, so there's an inclination to use it. But it's important to remember that it was never designed to evaluate policy. Right? The prim primary primary objective of these groups is to clean up the beaches. Secondary is often the data collection, and so they're doing it in ways that meet their needs. They're they have, in my research never doing it to evaluate policy. Um, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, because it has so much data available, does present a conservative option for doing uh, long-term analysis and to potentially use it to look at the effectiveness of EPR, but there's a lot of considerations there. Uh, but the vast majority of data sets are just not appropriate for doing that type of evaluate policy evaluation. Um, and also important to note that EPR does have unique demands of data because of its legislative structure for packaging here in the province. Um, the, the focus on residential, not commercial. And the fact that um, debris in itself is decentralized as a type of pollution and uh, stores can be a big um, limiting factor when trying to, to monitor the effectiveness of a, a specific intervention in one jurisdiction. So that all wrapped up, I think, EPR programs from my perspective, if they're interested in understanding their effect on reducing shoreline pollution levels, they need to look at a monitoring program that's tailored to meet its own needs. And that type of program would uh, have accurate data re resolution based on the legislative structure, um, more consistent temporality. So a lot of the cleanup data is on an annual basis, so talking about monthly, potentially. Also, consistent categorization, so really looking at all the categories of packaging that's out there and trying to collect data on that. And then, from my perspective, I think count is a really important category. Uh, or metrics, sorry. Um, weight is often something that's being proposed, but as materials become lightweighted, um, it will skew the results in, in a long-term analysis as well. Uh, lightweight materials may be more susceptible to degradation, thereby compounding um, the problems with weight, so uh, count is definitely a preferred approach. So yeah, thank you very much. For Very much, Lucas. Uh, our final speaker will be Usman Valiente, and then we'll have some time for questions. Assuming Usman, <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to pound you with a PowerPoint. So, uh, 
just going to uh, talk about a few things um, that I think um, I'm going to try to wrap up with some of the speakers have said. I mean, my purpose is getting these panels, and so I could say the least amount today. But um, so um, we've done some work. Uh, a group of I, David and Heidi, have done some work for Canadian Councils of Industries and the Environment, and do some supplemental work for some uh, producers, uh, a producer group uh, on circular economy. Uh, as it relates to plastics. And so I want to talk a little bit about that as sort of a unifying concept around what to do about plastics in our economy. So just some background data. In Canada, we generate about 4 million metric tons of plastic waste a year. Approximately, that number is a rough number. Uh, Environment Canada right now has got a study where they're going to be getting a better handle on that data. It's approximately right. About a we recycle less than 15% of that. So the, the bulk of the plastics generated in our economy and the plastics include uh, this laminated wrapper, which is a low density polyethylene that's laminated with aluminum that's got a uh, printing on, on top of it. And then this thing, which I, I pulled out of the garbage back there, which is actually not recycling in garbage, is polyethylene terephthalate, uh, waxed uh, cardboard, and then a low density polyethylene spoon straw thingy. In it. And this was so. This was in the garbage. So, this this stuff, the carpet on the floor, uh, the pen, the plastic in your pen. This is all the sort of uh, plastics that we're using in our, our economy. And why do we use plastics? They're easy to form. They're cheap. They're durable. Um, they can be used in a ubiquitous. Uh, they're ubiquitous because they can be used for manufacturing so many different things. Um, and so they deliver a tremendous amount of benefits. Um, in their use, but we've got we've got a waste problem, and so um, that problem it starts with the fact that we extract raw materials, which is typically natural gas or oil. We then produce plastics, so various polymers. The Lucas talked about low density polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, on and on and on. These all have physical properties. There are there are different polymers go in them to give them these functional capabilities, and then we typically use them once. And then we either dispose of them, as I said, less than 15% are recycled, and that disposal may be go to landfill, discarded into the environment, as we've heard, or burn, which essentially burning plastics is essentially burning a fossil fuel. I mean, this is just your natural gas gets parked in the plastic for one use and then it goes off and gets burned. You're essentially burning it as a fossil fuel. So that's typically what happens today. Uh, the Nirvana circular economy world would look something like this, and then I want to talk about how we get there. So a circular economy for plastics would look like drawing carbon dioxide out of the air, using sunlight to split water, taking the hydrogen from the, from the water that you split, combining it with the carbon dioxide and producing uh, plastic. So you could produce ethylene from that, or you produce methanol, and you can produce and there's various chemical steps to doing that. There's a company Carbon Engineering in Squamish, where I live, that's capturing carbon dioxide from the air, and that can be used to produce fuels, or it can be used, used to produce plastics. So we now got renewable plastics, and we now put that into the economy. Now we have systems to recover that plastic and repurpose that plastic, reuse it. So we've got refurbishing and remanufacturing of plastic components, <laughs> plastic products or we've got recycling of those plastics to capture back the embodied energy and emissions that are in, the, in that plastic. So today there's embodied energy and emissions in that plastic that go to waste, and in a circular economy, we're now capturing the value that we put in, in the front end by capturing sunlight and, and carbon dioxide and making plastic. We're a long way from that world, so we have to take another step. So some, some of the things that Dominic talked about are those first steps that we need to take. And so we are now looking at various policies that will take this linear take, make, waste economy and start to bend it into a, cir a circle. And so that's a process. And that process of public policy is path dependent. If you make the wrong decision to start with on your policies, you're not going to get to the right place. And so understanding where we want to go is very important. So things that are not waste related, carbon pricing, low carbon fuel standards, things that will decarbonize the transportation of, of raw materials, decarbonize the transportation of materials through the economy, um, those will have a positive effect in terms of bringing out the overall carbon intensity of the life cycle of these products. They'll also decarbonize our recycling systems. 
And so these are important policies. But what can we do about plastics themselves really relates to the first steps that we can take. So we've heard about extended producer responsibility. I want to be clear on what that really means practically. I was involved in building the residential uh, producer responsibility model for packaging in British Columbia. We have a, a system, that was mentioned, Recycle BC, that manages packaging in general. We have Encore Pacific that manages beverage containers. We have a beer system for managing beer cans and refillable bottles. And these all sort of operate together and in synergy to, to start to close the loop. But there is a specific characteristic that EPR has in BC these are the other jurisdictions. It's not enough to make producers pay. It's not enough to have differentiated fees between materials. Those fees are important, but what you really need is producers to be obligated to operate the system. Because a circular economy by its very nature is a reverse supply chain. So you want to get producers engaged in that reverse supply chain. You want to have stringent targets. We've heard about targets, they're very important. Because once they have to meet a 90% recycling target or an 85 or whatever it is, they will then go into the economy and make investments to start to build this reverse supply chain to deliver that income. And so when they're individually liable for these outcomes, when they work together, they will then cause and induce these investments in the economy to start building these reverse supply chains. And so now you've got a pile of plastic that you've collected out of the economy, you're, you're meeting high targets. So that's you now created this supply of plastic. What can we do to increase the demand for plastic? And so other policies include minimum recycled content in plastics, and you can do that by saying 50% of your packaging, plastic packaging, needs to have recycled content, or as Dominic pointed out, you can use a tax. You can say the higher your recycled content, the lower the tax. You could have a sliding tax, for instance, that would work. And so there's different policy considerations on picking which one's the most optimal approach, but the general approach of recycle content standards to create demand for plastics and extended producer responsibility to create the supply when brought together, start to bend that linear economy into a circle. And so those are kind of the first uh, first steps that you take. And then of course, there's, you know, you, there's other policy measures that you can refine. You can uh, tax the disposal of plastics or waste in general. You can ban certain things and bans are, because we've heard, uh, can be quite effective. You can ban them from disposal or you can ban them from sale. You can ban plastic bags from being sold or you can ban the disposal of plastics from being disposed. So these are all supplementary policy tools that then add more uh, more force and more bending force to that linear, linear economy, making it much more costly to dispose of plastics um, and making the circular approach less costly and more desirable. So, we are using these economic instruments and levers um, to achieve that. So, so, you know, we now look at these policies and we try to determine in a market economy, and the market economies vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and, people, and jurisdictions are at different stages of evolution uh, around this. What are the policies that fit best with uh, making that next incremental step forward? And so, this is the kind of, of thing that at some point, this product will be either a reusable product or it will be <laughs> reconfigured in such a way that you will get all of the utility that you get out of this today with none of the waste. And that's really the long-term objective of this. So with that, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop there. I think some of this is gonna be better, better teased out of the questions. So David, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Richmond. Thanks for uh, finishing ahead of time. So, all kinds of interesting <laughs> ideas raised by our panelists today, and uh, so I want to now turn the floor over to you as uh, audience members to raise questions. Okay. I have a whole bunch of questions. If you don't have any, I'm happy to fill the time asking my questions. Well, I'm going to give you uh, first crack at it. So, questions, please just raise your hand. Yes, right here. Second one. And try and speak. Oh, yeah, there we go. Great. <clears throat> So, what is the biggest challenge do you see in uh, reinforces these bans? So, for example, if there's a local restaurant and they use a lot of packaging items, um, how how do you make sure that they will follow the bans? Because I don't think they you can place tax on them. Great question about implementation of some of these policies. Yeah. So, so um, this is. I mean. 
bans or taxes or all of these policy instruments mm -hmm. have broader considerations and some of those are how do you institutionalize this, how do you enforce them, how do you measure the outcomes, you know, Lucas talked about what are the outcomes of some of these policies and so when you look at a ban, for instance, when you ban things from disposal, so where do you enforce that ban? Typically when waste travels from a municipal collection system or a uh, industrial commercial institutional facility goes to a transfer station before it's disposed of. So you can enforce a disposal ban. The most efficient place to enforce it is at the transfer facility where you can actually see what's coming in down and then uh, determine whether they're in compliance with the ban or not. Now, if I'm a private waste company and I'm collecting from a restaurant and I get penalized at that point at that transfer station, I then go back to my customers and say, listen, I'm getting hit with fees at the transfer station. Um, you need to keep this plastic out of the waste stream or else I'm going to have to sur start surcharging you for plastic. And so that induces the private company to start to police what its customers are putting in there. So again, it's, you know, regulatory design. Like Dominic makes a great point. You can write an EPR law, you can write any law. It's not going to live on itself. It needs to be implemented in a way with supplemental measures like enforcement and measurement to, to make it come alive and actually work. Uh, next question. Um, thank you all for your presentations. It was really interesting content. If any of you are familiar with the Vancouver based company uh, Plastic Bank, I'm just curious what your opinions are on that approach of like social plastics. I don't want to answer all the questions, but I am I am familiar with it. And, and the plastic bank idea is that you purchase plastics back, and um, you then remunerate the folks that are bringing the plastic in. It's 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 the right concept. It uses an economic incentive. So you can, if you look at those pictures of all the plastics that are lying on beaches everywhere, and you go to developing countries, the actual EPR implementation model, if you were to make producers responsible, would be for them to put a bounty out to pay for the plastics that are coming in so that they could pull that plastic in and recycle it. And so, you, uh, you know, a bounty system that we have today that's very common is a deposit system. You pay a deposit, you get your deposit back when you return the ball. Well, another bounty system is to actually pay for kilograms of plastic brought in. And so that concept is a good good prototype for, for what we're talking about. I don't, personally, I don't think that's a scalable model globally, unless you have some instrument uh, like the one uh, that we talking about. One of the things we're looking at now in the UK is taking the, the principle of a bottle deposit and applying it to all plastic and potentially to all the packaging. So you're basically saying uh, in lieu of a uh, raw materials tax, and I think if, if you think we can plastic, tax plastic, then you should also tax metal, wood, all the other uh, primary materials that we use, because basically we're just consuming too much. Uh, but if we want to actually give the secondary material um, an economic advantage over the primary one, which is environmentally justified, the externalities of the order 100, 100 plus, depending on the material that you're talking about, Canadian dollars per ton. Then let's put a deposit on the material, um, let's put a charge on the material up front, and then reward the recycler when they demonstrate evidence that that has been recycled. And that effectively gives some advantage to the secondary material processes vis a vis the primary materials, and you start to lead to the substitution of the secondary for primary. Uh, just on the, 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 the band question, there, so, uh, my, my understanding is perhaps talking about the product type bands as well. So, if somebody's, you know, if we're going to ban stores, for example, we, we, you just stop people from selling them. Now, I'm really interested, not, in, not just in citizen science, I'm interested in citizen enforcement. We have a piece of the packaging law in Europe called the essential requirements. And those essential requirements were intended to ensure that uh, packaging was not over-specified in terms of size. Now, you know if you buy anything online today, you get a massive box and inside it you get a pen drive. And, um, and, and it's crazy. Well, why have you got such a large box for something so small? That law was intended to prevent that. 
and it isn't enforced by the member states. And we're currently tasked by the European Commission to look at exactly that law. Now, what I'm quite interested in doing is getting citizens to be the people who report back on those instances of overpackaging. So if you want to tweet to the regulator an instance of overpackaging, I suspect initially that regulator is going to be bombarded because every time I go to any discussion about any issue on waste management, I have to spend the first 10 minutes talking about overpackaging. So let's use citizens to enforce bans. I think we can do it. Thanks, Albert. I can just speak up. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, my question is actually regarding Steph's presentation. You mentioned um, that the UN is actually uh, talking about the idea of like a globally coordinated um, agreement in which countries all stand together to use plastic. Um, and then from that, you were picking up one idea could be um, countries implement like, their own strategies and set their own goals. And there's just one like the Paris Climate Agreement, and of course, in pursuit of like the NDCs, they didn't actually work very well, and a lot of countries, for the most part, failed to reach those goals. So, if that maybe is the best way, if you can, um, if you guys talk about alternatives to that, obviously, we can't really tell countries how they have to act, but um, just wondering more about that situation. And how yeah, it's, it's super interesting. It's only sort of <clears throat> the discussions really only been happening in the last six months, really. Um, and, uh, Early 2018, the UN Environment Programme um, co uh, coordinated a group, the ad hoc open ended expert group on marine litter and microplastics, and they were basically tasked with trying to figure out what are the best options. Do we take some kind of um, international agreement that's already in place, the Basel Convention or something like that, or um, in Stockholm to, to modify that to make some kind of um, uh, enforcement or agreement among countries to reduce the plastic? pollution or how they manage their plastic waste. And I think it's, um, when we talk about something like the Paris Agreement, it's, it's, it relates to the fact that waste management is a very local scale issue. What happens on the ground in, in Vancouver is very different to what happens on the ground in New Zealand. So um, when you, if you have, you have a target of reduction and that can be scaled to the country and say, you have to reduce your emissions by 20% or 50% or something like that. And you can choose any manner of um, mechanisms to achieve that, whether that's the you know, whether that's bans, whether that's um, changing the, the packaging structure. So it allows the flexibility among nations to actually choose how they, they get to that target. Um, and of course, it relies on the countries agreeing to a target and saying this is what we want to achieve. But I, I think there's a real appetite among many nations that are, that are dealing with this issue. Plastic pollution is not just an ecological issue, it's a, it's a human health issue, there's um, food security issues around plastic being used to buy fish and marine organisms that we eat. Um, so the, the scope of what the impacts of plastic pollution are, are enormous. Um, and so I think countries realise that and recognise that. Of course, there's going to be those places that are just like, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, but that's going to be the case for any type of international um, issue you need to deal with at this scale. So I'm hopeful. I think it's going to be, um, it means a lot of um, positive action happening. Yeah, that's great answer, Steph. Thanks for that. And the one thing I would just add to that is that there are, you know, we can talk about what the policy should be, but one of the reasons we don't have the policies, and this goes back to what Usman was saying about the qualities of plastic, one that you didn't mention is that it's extraordinarily profitable as well. And, you know, the, there are these vertically integrated oil and gas companies that are, in the last two years, have invested over $180 billion in additional plastic production in the United States alone. We're currently, as Steph said, at about 400 million tons a year. That's going by at least 5% a year. Uh, if you grow to 5% a year, the total amount doubles in 14 years. So uh, we have, and those companies are not going to go easily into the night. So uh, it's a it's a major policy making challenge that I think we need to be clear on as well. Uh, I mean, the thing I'd say about that, that I mean, that's absolutely correct. And um, when you talk about the petrochemical sector today, and I described the life cycle, you extract natural gas and oil, and you crack it. And you you make ethylene, you make plastic, that is extremely profitable and it's subsidized by government. So, um, but you can go another route too, which is you can have a petrochemical sector that's about renewable plastics, car capturing carbon and producing renewable plastics, 
that becomes another value decision for governments on what trajectory they want plastics to go on. So, um, but right now the incumbents are very powerful. I just want to add to that as well, and I think it's something that doesn't often get talked about in this um, discussion of um, alternatives. If we're looking at alternative feedstocks and um, replacing the traditional fossil fuel based plastics with um, some other type of material, say a plant based plastic, there's a lot of land use issues that are associated with, and this, that's not part of the discussion as well. And I think um, it's, it's about saying <coughs> we're using an awful lot of stuff in general in life. And we can't continue using that much stuff on a daily basis because A, there's nowhere to put it, we're limited in resources and there's global climate change issues and all these other things that are associated with it. The externalities of plastic pollution are, are, are so massive it's hard to even grasp them. Um, so when you start thinking about, well, oh, okay, um, if we replace the, the feedstock and move away from the carbon-based um, or a, a, a fossil fuel-based feedstock and, and turn it into plants or something else, then you've got to deal with the, the other issues alongside that, the land use change, the potential carbon emissions from the, that land use change as well. So there's a lot of other discussions that sort of stem out of these um, alternative sources. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Let's pick one from the middle. Um, sorry. Uh, thank you guys for your talk. Um, so a lot of the policy tools and kind of economic levers that we talked about today were unquote stick methods, you know, bans, taxes, um, EPR. And so I was wondering if you could just speak to some potential compatible, I don't know, quote unquote, carrot policy methods that um, might, uh, you know, in, uh, incentivize subsidization or incentives that could be uh, compatible with that. I know we talked about subsidizing, subsidizing removal plastics, but are there any other um, incentives that you could see working? Um, I, I, I start, struggle a little with the distinction between carrot and stick. For me, it's an incentive. And what we, if, if we're giving people uh, carrots, we need the money to, to, to make the carrot. And um, so typically, if we're going to subsidize things, we're, we're, we're often subsidizing some form of consumption. And the bottom line is that we're consuming too much of that. We're not internalizing any of the externalities that are subsidizing, as Usman was saying, um, fossil fuel extraction. G20 has been saying year after year after year, phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Do they? No. And we're still, they're still going up. And so we're in this crazy situation where we have this massive problem of climate change, we're subsidizing, taking stuff out of the ground. We should, we should be leaving them. So the idea of, of um, carrots, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical. We've had a, uh, an interesting debate, obviously, with the um, the Starbucks and so forth, giving 50p off a, a cup if you bring your refillable one in. And, um, you know, the behavioral economics, the theory behind that suggests, well, actually, people are much more averse to losses than they are to, so they're going to respond much more strongly, we think, to a 25, 30, as I said, 40 cent Canadian, Canadian cent charge on a cup, and they'll start bringing the refillables in. The interesting thing is that because nobody is doing that, or very few people are doing it at the moment, we don't have enough information about the, the, the demand the elasticities for that. We think they could be quite significant. But frankly, even if they were, if they weren't, the Canadian Treasury would have a few billion to play with. Because um, it's, it, you know, there are a lot of single use cups being consumed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree with Dominic that in a, in a heavily subsidized system, throwing more subsidies at the other side doesn't make a lot of sense. I think you need to really go after these externalities. I mean, why the fundamental reason we use plastics once and throw them away because it's cheaper to go and get raw materials and make that plastic again. That fundamental um, economic disconnect or, uh, is what's causing the overconsumption. So when you start to internalize these costs, people will be a lot more rational about how much plastic they put in. So if you've got this fully circular life cycle where all of the costs of your choices are borne by you, you're much more judicious about how you're going to deliver things. And that's where things like, you might say, recycling this stuff doesn't make any sense. Let's go to a reusable system. Because let's amortize the cost of each trip over, over uh, of this unit over a number of trips. And so that's the most cost effective way. And that's when you start getting different decisions made when you start 
going after each one of these sort of externalities and subs which are effectively subsidies and, and, and start making different decisions. Yeah, okay, well, really fantastic to have four individuals here speaking to us, uh, four individuals who are, who are and who have done so much work in delivering solutions to the problem of plastic pollution. And the good news is that there are solutions. So for example, Norway has a very uh, rigorous extended producer responsibility program for drink bottles, and they're getting a 98% rate of return, and they're taking that policy, now they're applying it to recycle the content of the drink bottles. So there are solutions out there, and uh, these are the types of folks bringing those solutions to the world. So let's give them a big hand. <laughs>